Hello, welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester, I'm the Director of Public Programs here, and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's Hammer Conversation with Rabbi David Wolpe and Roya Hakakian. Uh, I want to extend a special thank you to the Sinai Temple for co-presenting this program tonight, and a very special thank you to my dear colleague, Rebecca Small, who is the Program Director at Sinai Temple. Yay, Rebecca, and she's gone to great lengths to make this program happen tonight, so thank you, Rebecca. Our speakers today are Rabbi, Rabbi David Walpi and Roy Hakakian, and together they're going to discuss Iran, human rights, and the Persian Jewish diaspora. Rabbi David Walpi is the rabbi of Sinai, Sinai Temple in Los Angeles. He previously taught at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in New York, the American Jewish University here in LA, Hunter College, and he currently teaches at UCLA. Rabbi Wolpe is the author of seven books, including the national bestseller, Making Lost Matter, Creating Meaning in Difficult Times. And he has a new book entitled, Why Faith Matters, which he has agreed to sign after the talk tonight in the lobby. In case you didn't already know, he's one of the hippest rabbis out there. You can uh, find out for yourself by following him on Facebook. He's the recipient of innumerable honors and awards, including being named one of the 100 most influential Angelinos by Los Angeles Magazine one of the 50 most influential Jews in the world by the Jerusalem Post, and this year he was named the number one rabbi in America by Newsweek. So his rabbinical work has been profiled in the New York and LA Times, and he regularly writes for many publications, including the LA Times, the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, New York Jewish Week, beliefnet.com, the Jerusalem Post, the LA Jewish Journal, and others. He's been on television numerous times, featured on series on PBS, a and &E, the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, as well as offering commentary on the Today Show, CNN, CBS, etc. cetera. Um, now, Roya Hakakian is an author and Farsi poet. She was born and raised in a Jewish family in Tehran and came to the United States in May 1985 on political asylum. Roya is the author of two collections of poetry in Persian and is listed among the leading new voices of, in Persian poetry in the Oxford Encyclopedia of the Modern Islamic World. And her poetry has also appeared in numerous anthologies around the world. She serves on the board of Refugees International and is a founding member of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center. Roy was also a Guggenheim Fellow in 2008. Her most recent book, The Assassins of the Turquoise Palace, about Iran's terror campaign against exiled Iranian dissidents in Western Europe, was named a notable book of 2011 by the New York Times Book Review and was on Newsweek's top 10 not-to-be-missed books of 2011 list. Her memoir of growing up a Jewish teenager in post-revolutionary Iran, called Journey from the Land of No, A Girlhood Caught in Revolutionary Iran, was Publishers Weekly's best book of the year in 2004. Her opinion columns, essays, and book reviews appear in English language publications like the New York Times, the Daily Beast, Newsweek, the Wall Street Journal, and on NPR's All Things Considered. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Rabbi David Wolpe and Roy Hakakian. So thank you all for coming. Um, there's lots to talk about, but uh, I, I think that probably we should start with your beginnings. Um, my guess is, from a quick look at the audience and also in anticipation beforehand, that many people here will have some sense of what it's like to grow up in Iran, but mm -hmm. a lot of them won't. Um, right. And uh, especially to grow up as a precocious girl in Iran is different, I assume, from other people's experience. So I know this is an overly broad beginning, but what was it like? Well, <clears throat> I think what made it profoundly different and uh, I'm dating myself by saying this, was, was to live through the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Uh, because I think Iran could have been very much like, uh, you know, perhaps uh, India or um, Iraq right. um, when we were growing up. But what, what suddenly transformed everything was 1979. But prior to that, um, and uh, we can chalk that up to, to being a, little girl growing up uh, in a happy family. Right. But uh, I remember that we, we liked being where we were. Um, I remember that 
Um, we had a peaceful life alongside our neighbors who surprisingly came from all walks of life. Uh, the neighbors to our left were Baha'is, the neighbors across the street were Armenian, and unlike what Iran has been portrayed in the media, it was quite a, a eclectic, religiously eclectic neighborhood, and, and uh, if memory serves me, we got along, and it was a, a peaceful collaboration within the neighborhood. But the, the Iran that's portrayed in the media is the post-revolutionary Iran, by and large. Um, yes, but I don't think that the pre-revolutionary Iran got its due either. I, right. I don't think we understand the value of, of how multicultural uh, Iran has been. And, and I think that it's, it's a very dangerous thing that our entire memory of Iran is only 33 years old, whereas the entire country is one of the most ancient nations within yes, the region. Yes, but this is America. We don't, right. uh, we <laughs> we don't, don't take other history. people's history <laughs> right. at all seriously. Um, and, and I say that, although the, the truth is that I think Americans get hold of one or two bits of fact about a place and feel as though, OK, now I understand that place. Um, and, and the revolution was, uh, aided and abetted that process by, mm -hmm. by its sort of caricature of itself as being, and in fact, your title is from the land of no, right. which is? It's true. Um, I did call it the land of no. It was less because of the revolution or the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini and more sort of this um, protracted experience of being a girl. In, in a male-dominated society. And you know, when I look at it now, and I look at Egypt and Tunisia and, and all these countries that are supposed to be experiencing an Arab revolution, right. a spring of sorts, I think at the end of the day, um, it's, it's a war against egalitarianism that's holding all of us back. And so when I called my memoir, Journey from the Land of No, I was primarily referring to the experience of being a girl in a society where everybody, everybody's first response to you will be no, even before they have heard what your question is. And I resented that profoundly. I, I remember, since you're a rabbi, I'm bringing you a childhood complaint, <laughs> uh, which was, uh, so I just, <laughs> yeah. please take right, notes. Right. Um, I remember in the synagogue where, um, we used to go to and was closest to our, my home, which was Abri Shami, and I was also a student there. Mm -hmm. um, we, we did the Shabbat services in such a way that there was this very angelic sounding, very blonde boy who used to lead the, the singings of the hymns. And uh, there came a point where I thought, what a fabulous thing he's doing. You know, he would sing Le Chadodi, and everybody else would follow. It was just two words, but I thought it was fantastic that he would get his chance to belt this out. Right. And after a while, I thought, I want to do this. I want to be David. And so I went up to, to my Hebrew teacher, and I said, you know, you think I'm a cool student. You know, I'm doing well. How about it? You know, can I, can I do this? And, and, and he said, of course not. Right. And, and that kind of set me on a journey to to try to negotiate with my God, you know, reconcile my understanding of what Judaism was. And, and I really began thinking, and this is even before the Iranian Revolution, that these were all the wrong interpretations of Judaism as I knew it. Did you have, <laughs> did you have any allies? Um, I didn't, no. But what became sort of my ally or alibi or um, what, what sort of affirmed me was the Iranian Revolution, that I thought, well, you know, I may not like the guy who's being identified as the leader of this revolution, but wait a minute, you can have a system set up in, in one way, and everybody believes in it, but somebody else can come and upend it. Uh -huh. And, you know, could, could we do this with other things? And, and I thought, everybody's definition of, of what, you know, Jews could do or couldn't do um, had to be upended. And I remember, because uh, my family was quite observant, and my father ran one of the 
Hebrew day schools that uh, existed in Iran at the time. So uh, I, I considered myself a very devoted Jew. And at the end of my nightly prayers, I started having a dialogue with God. And I was saying, I know you don't like the stuff that they're doing over there. And you know, you and I will do something together. I mean, I really thought that uh, there was a way to reinterpret all of this. And, uh, and I think that the upsurge of the Iranian revolution somewhat uh, put me on a path to think that one could challenge uh, what seemed to be unchallengeable. And I'm just curious, just to follow this thread for a second, had you encountered that at all? Were you aware of the possibility that that could really be done before you came to the United States? And were you shocked when you saw that there were female rabbis, female cantors, that in no, fact everything I, that you imagined was, was happening? I am sure I would be dismaying you by saying that, uh, you know, by the time that I got into my teenage years, I was done with religion altogether. You actually would and be sorry. surprising me if you said otherwise. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> I thought you were going right. to excommunicate no, this is, me. No, this is, <laughs> you know? this is par for the course. But I don't um, live in California, so right, you wouldn't okay. worry me. No. <laughs> but, um, but, um, and no. my own rabbi back there No, we care. get them back when they have kids. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Uh, so, so but, I, but nonetheless, was it, was it not, I mean, didn't you look at it with some wonder, even if you were out, felt yourself outside the system, to realize that that was possible in the world? No, um, because, it, it, I mean, really, I, I was profoundly done with religion, right. and I thought it was a backward thing. And of course, you know, the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini and the Islamic system really just affirmed it. And, and the stories that was being filtered to us in Iran about what Israel was like, because we, it wasn't yeah. like you know we lived in a free society and we had our own free access to the experiences of Jews in Israel to know that it was varied and, and multi-layered, uh, convinced me that you know there was nothing to, to hoot about there either. So, so tell those of us who grew up here, mm -hmm. what about growing up in Iran was better than growing up here? First of all, I mean, I get invited to, to a lot of colleges and um, where I realize that young people aren't interested in politics, right. which I find entirely shocking in, in a great part because politics was so interesting to us. It was the greatest love that, you know, when you were a teenager and you didn't know what to do with all the tumult that was taking place in your veins, really, right. Um, you directed it at, at something larger than yourself. And, and this notion, now I can't really credit all of this to Iran, obviously, because I don't think the generation that's coming out of Iran today had the blessings that my generation under those circumstances right. had. But, but the notion that I was bestowed when I was growing up, that you have to care about something larger than yourself, which is in a way religious. Mm -hmm. It's just that there was no God in this particular um, brand Same of thinking. Um, what was something entirely Iranian. I remember that you know, as early as 13 and 14, we used to have, um, we used to organize groups um, and go mountain climbing on Friday mornings, which is the day that we have off in Iran. And the idea was that we packed very little food so we would exercise the notion of giving to each other by the time we got up there and we were all hungry. Mm. Um, so what was it like to have less food than we all needed? And what was it like to give it over to someone else? So, so all this training, um, being sort of a good citizen for your community, right. caring about what happened to the society in which you were um, a member, um, and ultimately caring about some fundamental values um, which were conveyed to us through the wonderful filter of literature. Um, we all grew up, as I'm sure many members here, um, with a great deal of poetry. Right. And, and it, it wasn't just about a combination of words, but it was also about values. Um, um, so all of that were things that I wouldn't switch with any other experience anywhere. You can give me um, Geneva and Switzerland, and I would still choose Tehran to have been born and raised in. 
do you miss the country itself? Um, yes and no. I mean, uh, the Iran today isn't the Iran that I right. would like to go back right. to. Um, not that they would have me back, <laughs> by the way. Right. Um, as, a, as a reporter working with CBS uh, News, um, I applied to renew my passport and they wouldn't give it to me because they didn't want me to go back. Um, but, but I do miss the experience and in a way um, I try to reconstruct um, the Iran that I remember and love. In, in writing, in conversations like this, right. and you know, as I go along. And um, so the, the way, in part, that you dealt with the um, revolution was by writing about its consequences, in particular in your second book um, about a trial, and, uh, well, about a series of assassinations followed by a trial in Germany. Uh, and I wonder if you, I wonder, first of all, what drew you to the story? Well, um, shall I say tell a what little bit? Story? Tell okay. a little bit about so, what it is, and right, exactly, if you would. So my first uh, book was a memoir of growing up in Iran, but fortunately, <laughs> for everybody who thinks that it's a memoir of an entire life, it isn't really. Right. It's a memoir of ten years, um, 1974 to 1984. Uh, it's a very focused slice of time. Um, the second book is about uh, a political assassination of a, uh, a group of Iranian opposition leaders uh, in 1992 in Berlin, Germany at a restaurant called Mykonos. Um, so why did uh, a good Jewish girl who had written a relatively successful memoir right. decide to write about a political assassination? Um, Which, by, just to insert, the, your memoir is also a portrait of a family. Yes. It's not only about a girl growing up in Iran, but it's also about an Iranian family. And yeah. that's, I mean, it gives an insight into what all the things that you were just saying that's really very beautiful. Right. So anyway. Right. Thank you. Um, well, in part because um, I'm a very stubborn human being. And I remember when the early reviews of my memoir came through, um, my editor called me up and said, hurry and do the second portion right. of your first memoir. And I said, what? And she said, well, you ended the memoir in 1984, so bring it up to date and do 1984 till today. And I thought, if this is exactly what they want me to do, my job is to, to do, not to do it. To do something else. And that's exactly what I did. I, I decided not to do it. Now, um, it wasn't just really uh, sheer stubbornness. It was also that I thought I'm an artist and I don't want to be pigeonholed into this genre of memoir writing. Um, and, and I think what really irked me was the fact that my editor kept referring to me as a memoirist. And I kept saying, what's a memoirist? I'm a writer. Right. I can write about anything. Um, and she said, no, 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 no. Memoirists <laughs> write from the first person singular perspective and that's what you can do. And I said, well, in that case, I'll have to do something entirely different. Um, so creatively, it was important for me um, as an artist to do something entirely different, to flex my muscles, so to speak, and to show that I could do um, more to myself, more than anyone. But it was also, I think, I mean, I spent some time convincing you that I'm a bad Jew, but right. let me convince you that I'm also a good Jew. Um, <laughs> in that I decided that what would a Jewish person, how would a Jewish person apply the most enduring Jewish values to a story like Iran? And what could I bring into this debate? Because there's surely no shortage of experts on Iran. And there's surely no shortage of people who write books about Iran. So I really thought, what could I do from the unique perspective of a member of a community whose existence in Iran is on the verge of extinction? Mm -hmm. What is it that I can say, given that I have no longer an investment, that my community is not going to be there 20 years from now, 
I will not lose anything if I simply told the truth because I am in the position to actually say the truth. I have no dog in the fight. My investments are finished. Right. And therefore I decided that I can freely look at the story of this community and bear witness to the things that everybody else wants to obliterate from history. Mm -hmm. And the story of what had happened to members of the Iranian diaspora, um, artists, writers, um, opposition leaders, those who, like us, um, members of the Jewish community, had been forced to leave Iran but because they didn't have another community to go to, you know, right. like us here, you know, we were embraced by, by you, by, by the American Jewish community. We had, we could easily make the transition and make a home, but you know, what would a, an Iranian secular writer have a place to go to? So I thought, I thought my job was to look at what had happened in the past 30 years and find the threads within the story that everybody wanted to bury and forget, and certainly the regime wanted to bury right. and forget. And I thought the story of, of the assassinations, the story of the people who seemed dispensable by, by the Europeans on one hand, who were turning a blind eye to their assassinations, and certainly by the regime who was going around and killing them, and you know, by, by a bereft community who couldn't take the time to take the record of what had happened because uh, the, it, it had too much on its plate. And so I decided to write about this particular assassination, this thread of story, because I thought I could bear witness, I could keep a record of what uh, was going to be forgotten. I, I do want to say, just to, to the audience out there, um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions about the book, but I actually don't want to ask too many because it really reads, it is a thriller in a sense and a detective story and almost like it could almost be written by John Grisham. I mean, there's a trial and there are all sorts of twists and just when you think it's reached the point where it's over, it's not over. Um, and I don't want to tell you the ending because you should read it yourself. Um, but it's happy. But yes. <laughs> But it's, let me put it this way. It's, it's a book that will be very satisfying when you close the last page. Um, so uh, more satisfying than happy, because happy is hard. Right. An assassination doesn't, right. Um, but, uh, but actually, one of the things that interested me about the book is that it's a book with a great deal of drama and a great deal of character interest and some very colorful people. But the humor is all in the epigrams that begin each chapter, right. um, and some of them are very funny. Uh, and what I, what I wondered about it in particular was your, I now understand part of the logic, you completely don't appear in that book in the same way that your, that the first book is all about you, right. um, but or you so must have seems. done, yes, but you must have done a tremendous amount of personal interviews and research to put that all together. So how did you get access to all these people and how did you get them to talk? Well, it's very because it's, um, it's fearful. It must, they must be at least a little bit afraid. There's still many of them. If I, I, I mean, every time I say I worked on it for four years, I'm afraid that people will look at me and say, "Are you that stupid? You know, why mm. would it take four years to, you know, to oh, investigate right. something?" Um, I mean, I, I don't know if it's a good thing if I should actually say how long it took or not. But there it is. Right. I it, it, it was I'm a four-year process, right. and and part of it was because. Um, I had to just simply stick around in Berlin, Germany, mm -hmm. uh, where my characters were primarily ex living, uh, just to tell them or show them that I was serious and, and I was willing to listen to anything they had to say right. at their own pace. I remember the first day that I arrived at the home of um, the widow of one of the four people who had died in the restaurant. Uh, it was two o'clock in the afternoon. I had just had lunch and I came from outside and I figured two, you know, she will ask me some questions. By three, we will be done with the introductions and uh, then I can ask her my questions. 
it was over pizza at 10.30 that I got the chance to ask my first question. Mm. Um, I spent eight and a half hours straight listening to her because I realized that I had to, I had to hear the story or rather she needed to tell me the story that according to her own account, right. the way she wanted to tell it. And then I had to listen to it in, in the fashion that a therapist or perhaps a rabbi will have to lend an ear to, to someone and listen to the story in, in, the, in the combination of sentences that the person who's offering it likes to put it. And then, you know, after about eight hours, I allowed the reporter, the investigator in me to, to begin to ask the questions. Well, also, had, had you spoken to me first, I would have told you that <laughs> Persian events always go longer <laughs> than you think they're going to. Um, it's at least been my experience. Yeah. So I'm going to have to take it. Pizza here. at 10.30 is early, actually. <laughs> I, usually, they don't serve the pizza till 1, 2 in the morning. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> But so was it? Uh, oh, and the other thing was that the, um, you know, half of my characters or two thirds of my characters were Iranian, um, who were basically waiting for 15 years since this, this story had had uh, taken place to talk, and no one had gone to them to mm -hmm. really talk. Uh, so they were filled with the story right. that they were busting to tell. But the other half, or one third of the population that I had to talk to were Germans. And Germans are many things, uh, but being warm and talkative right. not uh, isn't among them. <laughs> and, and so um, my hero, my, my, or I should say one of my most important heroes, Bruno Joost, yeah. uh, who was the prosecutor of this case, uh, was a prosecutor. And, you know, I. I take eight right. and a half hours to get to my subject. Bruno Yost would put me on a half an hour clock. Right. And you know this just didn't work. And so I basically had to wait for him to retire you know, <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> from, from being a prosecutor. And once he retired, I remember I had to strategize because I, I sent him an email. Uh, and fortunately, fortunately, and this is all lessons for my, retire my own retirement when I teach a journalism class. Fortunately, his wife uh, was the English speaker. And, he, and so I com was communicating with her. I wrote her saying that I wanted to interview them mm -hmm. again. And so obviously he said, why? You know, I've already given you three 20-minute right. interviews. <laughs> and, and 20 minute interviews wouldn't help me you know, build character, build the scenery. I wanted much more. Um, so I said um, that I had some more questions, and I threw a bunch of them at them. And then I said, can we all go to dinner together? Can I come to your town? Because I thought if I went to an office or something, he would still put me on the clock, and right. it would be the same story. And she said, what time would you like to come for dinner? I said, what about 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Because <laughs> I thought the earlier I'd start, the more time right. I would have, because you know, if they serve dinner at 8, yes. I'll have a three, four hour head start. And, and the wife came, uh, which was extremely lucky, but also by design. I wanted her to right. be there. So as he was walking with uh, my translator, who had been his translator throughout the trial, I asked all the romantic questions from the wife. Mm. How did you meet? I mean, the kinds of things right. that he would have never allowed me to ask, uh, and he would have never answered. How did you meet? Where did you fall in love? You know, right. when did you kiss the first time? I mean, all the things that uh, no prosecutor, especially not a German, would have answered. And then um, by the time we got to the restaurant, it, this was the longest interview I, I had with him. And uh, it turned out to be sort of a, um, also a 10 hour ordeal. And uh, I have, I mean, this is the Hammer Museum. In the basement of my uh, house, I have a Mykonos Museum. Yeah. Um, where I have something close to several hundred hours of interviews wow. with, with all the people that I've talked to. I have documents and evidence and transcripts and photographs of, of this whole thing. I, I, I want to get now to, to Iran and the diaspora, but 
but I'm just curious because your experience is so different, um, especially from people of my background and my assumptions. What did you learn about the German character from doing this series of interviews? Because in many ways, the Germans in this book come off extremely well. I, I, what I learned was that at least within the limited world that I wrote about, which right. is the German lawyers and judges, um, prosecutors and, and you know, illegal Germans involved in this case, right. uh, they're deeply affected by the Holocaust. Um, and the Holocaust in this entire story was the elephant in the middle of the room. Uh, you know, the, none, of, none of what I've written about has anything to do with Jews right. um, or the events of World War II, but it had everything to do with it. Mm. Because, um, I mean, we would be giving away the ending of the story or the, how did right. you put it? I don't you, you said I shouldn't call it happy. Right, uh, satisfying. Satisfying, thank you. The satisfying denouement. Thank you. The satisfying mm -hmm. denouement of, of my uh, book comes about as a result of the Holocaust uh, mm -hmm. because this generation who uh, got involved with this case as attorneys and judges knew that no matter what pressure German politicians placed on them, they had to do the right thing right. because they didn't want to have to be the guilty party who had to deal with the blemish of something immoral, mm. something that, that would leave them thinking that they had done the wrong thing right. at, at, you know, when, when they could have made a major difference. Mm. And I think that sense of moral pressure um, in the backdrop of what had happened um, was so important to the way that they conducted themselves, which was uh, morally upright and really honorable. So now, we talked for just a moment um, before, and we talked about a, a bunch of things, but one of the things that we talked about for a moment was the, was the Iranian community in Los Angeles as opposed to elsewhere. Um, and I wonder if you, I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that's remarkable about the Iranian community in America is that immigrations are almost always, almost always begin unsuccessfully. It takes them a long time to get up to speed. The Iranian immigration is the only one that I'm familiar with that either was successful either immediately or in very short order. So the first thing I want to ask you is, how did that come to be in your... I don't know, because yes. mine didn't come about immediately. So you should ask <laughs> no. the people who became immediately successful. Um, okay, but you saw the people around you, I mean, presumably, right. right? Where did you come to originally? New York. Okay. The people around and me there's... aren't the people in this room. Yeah. I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think the Iranians or the Iranian Jews who came to California had an entirely different configuration. Mm -hmm. um, First of all, I think at least the earlier uh, immigration, um, the late 70s or early 80s, uh, was primarily um, of people who were, um, came with means. Um, and by means, I don't only refer to financial, but also people who had already in Iran professions, uh, businesses, professions yeah. and businesses, had uh, Western connections right. you know, through their businesses or transferable per professions uh, that yeah. immediately could find an equivalent here. I'd like to put that into two words that yes. I've heard many times and I still don't know what they mean. Okay. Import-export. <laughs> I have heard, what are you in? Import-export. I don't know what, what gets imported and what gets exported, but that's to me international connections, import-export. Oh um, but also a, a generation of right. uh, kids who were bilingual already. You know, right. because they well, had first of all, they attended, came educated, right, exactly. Uh, or they had attended bilingual yes. schools. You know, when I came, I remember I, <laughs> um, they gave me the uh, TOEFL exam to take uh, when I entered, and I, uh, and I so didn't understand uh, the questions uh, and the comprehension portion that I thought that there was something wrong with the tape recorder. Mm. So I kept raising the volume, you know, and, 
And at the end, the room was shaking. You know, and I still didn't understand. And then I realized that it was really the language I wasn't getting. It wasn't, it wasn't the volume. So I think um, um, the early generation of Iranians who came here uh, came with means, period. Whatever broad uh, definition one can attribute to means. But also, I think, fortunately, they created a blueprint for others to come and use. You know, they created an infrastructure uh, that made it possible for other Iranians to come into. Now, you know, we take for granted that, you know, we know here how to, you know, apply for Social Security or these things are given to us when we were born. Um, but you have to figure these routine things out, you know, where the DMV is and how to get your driver's license and where you can go if you have, you know, X, Y, and Z problems. And so the community created an infrastructure which could address all these things. And I think it came with, uh, it was a sort of a mixed bag because I didn't want the blessings of having a blueprint or an infrastructure because I thought then I had to also buy into the traditions that it came with and the limitations that it placed upon a girl. And therefore I said, okay. you know, as great as this can be, I'll stay in Connecticut, which is where I stay. Um, so, so that's. You're not the, going there, are you? No, I am. I'm actually, I'm actually going there. Um, what I want to ask you is this: that in, in order, what you're saying is that in order to get the blessings of community, you have to agree to submit to some of the strictures of community, um, and that's, I suppose, that that's the immigrant tension in part, because immigrant communities do tend at first to stick together, and then each generation rebels to a greater or lesser extent against what the community demands of it. Um, so did you, I mean, so where you went, did you have a community at all of Iranian that you connected to, or were you? Well, I sought uh, my own, which right. was, um, the one I knew in Iran, um, literary community of, you know, Iranian writers and poets right. or people who were interested in um, literature, whether they wrote it or not. And uh, I found some, although uh, not at all uh, comparable to, to the one that exists here. Right. Um, but I think it was also, uh, in a way, a blessing because I missed not having the community I knew in Iran. Um, and therefore, I was pushed to discover my counterparts within the American community. And that took me to Allen Ginsberg at Brooklyn College. I remember mm -hmm. <clears throat> I thought, gee, you know, I, none of the poets I used to know or love teach here. Who can I find? Right. And I was at Brooklyn College at the time. And I was flipping through the graduate um, uh, course uh, program. And I saw Allen Ginsberg. I, I had read some of his work. And I, through the course description, there was, uh, there was a little uh, byline that said, um, anybody who wants to register in this course has to present uh, 30 poems um, in English in order to get in. And obviously, Allen had to like them. Right. Um, so I went to uh, Alan's office, and <clears throat> I had already published a book of poetry in Persian. And I, and I said, you know, Mr. Ginsburg, I really would like to be in your class. And he said, okay, so you have poems? And I gave him my Persian book. And he flipped through the pages and said, groovy. <laughs> And I think that meant that I was in, you know. Oh, yes. um, and it was a remarkably fabulous experience. And Alan was just the kind of person who um, I think knew how to read the things that he couldn't really read. I mean, right. had to had to read into a human being, had to read into a person. And just being around him was uh, was fantastic. And I. I also thought that you know, if I can hoodwink my way into his class, then maybe mm -hmm. I can hoodwink my way into writing in English, actually, yes. and, um, which is what really happened. How much English did you have when you came here? Uh, um, I'm not a pencil. 
I mean, I, very little. Yeah. Um, be, <laughs> mostly because uh, in, in post-revolutionary Iran, at least in the, in the immediate years after the revolution, um, the Arabic was the right. second language that they um, brought into schools. And so there was far more emphasis on Arabic than there was on English. So if you were giving advice then to not even necessarily Iranian immigrants, but immigrants in general, um, especially women, what would you tell them is, was most helpful to you in making your way? <laughs> I'm going to have to have dinner with these people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm leaving tomorrow. But yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I would say to girls that they have to really find their own distance, uh, at least for a while. Um, I, I mean, good families that value independence or really love their children will eventually uh, embrace them regardless. Right. Um, but I think, it, you know, the, the cliche is true that if you love them, you have to let them go. And um, you think that some Iranian families have difficulty doing that? <laughs> Do you? <laughs> right? <laughs> I just asked. I was with you people. Just asking a question. Do you think? I feel like you're trying to sort out your problems through this conversation <laughs> with me. My feeling is, see, my feeling is tomorrow you'll be gone. So you're not going to get into trouble. Me, I'm just asking. No, I mean, we talked about the fact that, obviously, there's a different cultural standard, generally, for women in the Iranian community. It's many of them live at home until they get married. Many of them won't leave to go to college. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to that. But my take on the way that you're describing your own experience is that you see the disadvantages as greater than the advantages. Is that? Well, yeah, but I think it, it also depends on the human being. I think I would have been, I knew from a very young age that I would be profoundly unhappy, right. unhappy to the point of being depressed um, and, and dysfunctional if I didn't do the things that I was driven to do. Right. Um, and therefore, you know, I, I knew that I had to do it if I were to, you know, be normal. Right. Um, I mean, normal according to my own terms. Of course. <laughs> but, um, but I think there are other uh, there are others who can you know who who aren't as driven, and I think uh, that it therefore presses them less. But I think in general, it, the other evolutionary um, destiny of of where communities go tells us that this is what's going to happen eventually, right. uh, you know, within 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, because uh, we will remain in America long enough that one generation um, will give birth to the next, and the next generation will allow more than the previous generation did. And I think we can be revolutionaries and pioneers by jump-starting the inevitable now, uh, because we know it's coming. We might as well make the lives of one generation easier earlier. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I don't you know agree, if this is. You agree, don't you? Well, I do agree. I'm, I do agree. And yet, um, especially because I'm supposed to be uh, asking you questions, I, the, <laughs> the, opposite, the opposite argument presents itself to me as it has before, which is that someone will say, I understand that you want us to follow more along the American model. But as we look around at families, it doesn't look like the American model is anything so great to follow. And in fact, if I think about my own congregation, many Iranian families have dinners with you know, 30, 40, 50 people, while next door, an American family is having two people, or one person, or maybe the kid came home from college and deigns to stop by and say hi before they go out with their friends. And so while there are advantages to um, to encouraging someone's self-fulfillment and freedom, you do lose exactly the kind of family that you describe in your first book, Growing Up In, mm -hmm. which you treasured. Mm -hmm. So there's a big loss there. It's not a small loss. No, but, but you know, um, the community that was so together in Iran was, lived in an undemocratic society. Yes. And 
we have the advantage of a democratic society. We can feel that if we let our girls go a little farther from the mm -hmm. house, um, we have the blessings of, of a civil society that will keep them safe, uh, whereas we couldn't be so sure back About then, 35 anymore. years ago. Um, so what if our girls were happier? Would then our gatherings, which may occur a little less frequently, be happier as a result? Um, I think there's a lot to be gained um, from being within this democratic uh, structure, including the fact that you know, people often ask me, what sort of Jews were they when you, were you when you were in Iran? Were you orthodox or reform or conservative right. or reconstructionist? And, and my response always is, these are all the divisions that you um, have the blessings of knowing because they came about as a result of a democratic country in which you could have debates about what sort of Jews you could be. In Iran, we didn't live in a democratic society and therefore we just had one kind of Jew, just like we had just one kind of Muslim. And I think we, we are, as immigrants, the people who can say, what did we bring with us? And with that additional dimension to our experience, to our you know, vast treasury of knowledge, how can we infuse it in this wonderful democratic structure in order to have more than our neighbors? The reason we as Iranians can come together is that is in fact because um, we are a little, we have a little extra right. because we, we, we are two dimensional people. Um, we are immediate immigrants and we have something to fall back on. And I think all of that makes us richer. You carry two worlds in you. Mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating uh, hearing you talk. I just wonder to what extent, as, as I see you as a, as a, as a, as a not just a feminist, but as an, assim as an assimilated feminist to some extent, clearly you aren't totally assimilated and you clearly you still have strong links to your Jewish identity. But to what extent do you privilege your Jewish identity over the other priorities that, uh, uh, that some people, some Iranian Jews might have. Do you think that, do you, looking 20, 30 years ahead, do you think that these Iranian Jews uh, in your community will retain their Jewish identity at all? Or would it all be lost by assimilation and perhaps even intermarriage? I must be looking particularly assimilated this evening because <laughs> I, I, I really don't ever feel assimilated myself. You, you would be surprised to know that uh, how often I um, enter a room or a gathering where I feel like, gosh, I don't belong here. Um, so I think feeling assimilated or seeming assimilated are two entirely different experiences. I, you know, um, we still have memories and sort of uh, internal scenarios that, that always run in the background and, um, you know, uh, really taint the way we look at the world and, and experience the world. So that said, I, I think, <clears throat> um, I think what, what actually has enabled me to consider myself Jewish, although several members of my own immediate family might not uh, extend me that <laughs> privilege uh, is that I realize that one can define one's own brand of Judaism, that, that, that um, it was a malleable, wonderful thing that one could sculpt into what one wanted to have uh, based on one's affinities and likes and dislikes. And what I, what I have most enjoyed um, over the past several years that I've arrived at this thing, uh, which is mine, which is my, my own personal brand of Judaism, is that um, I, am, I am in this privileged position from which to witness. Um, for instance, as, as I mentioned, look at Iran in the way that uh, many other people who have relatives left in Iran 
might someday want to go back to pick up where they had left off, um, aren't in the, in the position to see and, and, uh, and witness. And, and so in that way, I expect myself to continue to remain in this uh, wonderful sort of watch post uh, where I think my dual identity as an Iranian and a Jewish person grants me. Um, and do I think other you know, fellow Iranian Jews will lose uh, their Judaism? I, I hope not. I think if we, if we do uh, think that it can be uh, adjusted to, to become us in the way that, uh, that flexibly serves our needs and interests and loves and passions, then it, it is more likely to stay around as opposed to some, some rigid uh, formula into which we have to uh, kowtow as opposed to you know, passionately embrace. Do you think that as an Iranian Jew, um, we have responsibilities to build bridges with Iranian Muslims in US to improve the relationship and maybe reduce tension? between uh, Muslims and Jews? Um, you should feel free to answer some of these questions, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so you're asking me, does Roya feel <laughs> that um, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to look at it as, as some sort of a duty that we must perform. I think that uh, it's a pleasure uh, for us to um, be the ones who can uh, pave the way for, uh, for a more peaceful life that resembles the life that we remember, perhaps not from the, you know, from, from the hundred years ago in Iran where my father's memories are often uh, negative ones, uh, because you know so much was bad at the time. Iran was riddled with uh, so much poverty and um, and and just ethnic strife in general. But I think uh, most of us in this room can agree that the 60s and the 70s in Iran uh, were good times, uh, times of religious harmony, ethnic harmony, that the country was hitting. In a, in a far more harmonious direction than it, it ever had. And I think um, it, is, it would be wonderful for those of us who have been witness to that history to, to do the right thing by, by recounting those memories, by, by offering this uh, counter uh, uh, account of what's what Iran has been like because, uh, you know, it's portrayed as such a, you know, in such a biased view today that for those of us who, who know better, who have seen otherwise, um, yes, I think it, it would be um, a wonderful thing to do, but, but not just because it's a, it's a duty to do so, but also because I think um, it can be an enormous contribution uh, at a time when so much is at stake. I, I actually will address that because I, I think that it's also worth noting that the question is so radioactive. Um, the mutual fear and the triggers are so quick that in theory building bridges is good. In practice what often happens um, is that you get pilloried by your own community for trying to reach out to another community. And I'm not only saying this theoretically, the reason that I'm thinking about it is next week, um, Thursday night, we're having a unity concert at Sinai Temple. We're gonna have David Brozen, Neshama Karlbach, wonderful, uh, but people from all various religions. And the last time we had this, which was I think two years ago, we had a Muslim singer. Now. The, know that the concert is in support of Israel. So here's a Muslim guy standing on the beam of the synagogue singing in support of Israel. But as he's singing his prayer, he prays like a Muslim, i.e., he says, Allahu Akbar. 
people went nuts. They went, now only a small percentage, but they were very vocal. Um, I still have some of the emails and they weren't kind. Um, and it's because, and, and when I would write back and say, look, I know you're upset at what was said, but do you realize that this was a Muslim who was coming to a synagogue? And do you realize the coverage that takes and so on fell on deaf ears? And the people who were most upset, other than one particular couple that was not Iranian, were Iranians. And I still hear about it. You're the rabbi who let a Muslim come to your synagogue and say Allahu Akbar. So when it becomes that automatically fear-inducing, it's very hard to reach out. And generally what happens over time is that the Unfortunately, on all the sides, the people who would reach out tend to decide that it's not worth the very small group that cares about it to endure the pressure and disapproval of the much larger group that doesn't want to hear about it. So, yeah, it's a nice idea in theory, but, you know, look, I, I, Republicans and Democrats can talk to each other, right? And, and they're not... And this is not. Uh, this is a sort of lower level intensity conflict, but but if me, if any of you have friends on both sides of the divide, all you have to do is check your email today, and you know that I'm not just talking about people who were mildly upset. I mean people who were literally incapable of believing the other side was you know bipedal and human. Um, so that makes it tough. That makes it tough. Bipedal is excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my question for you is about your book and the assassination. Uh, not so long ago, there was this plot against the Saudi uh, ambassador. Um, that it was right about when your book came out, it was almost like you had planted this whole plot to promote your book. How do you feel? <laughs> she said almost like, oh. almost like. <laughs> How do you feel about more assassinations and whether CIA or the Western world is aware and is doing everything possible to avoid all what's going on behind mm -hmm. the scenes? Um, <laughs> I think, uh, so I think what, what really happened as, as sort of the positive upshot of the trial I wrote about, which concluded in 1997, uh, was that Iran eventually, and we are giving away the ending of the book, by the way, but um, uh, Iran was eventually uh, forced to cease uh, its terror operations, at least in the Western world. Uh, so in Europe and in the United States, um, Iran did no longer carry out uh, attacks um, on Iranian dissidents, or rather, I should say more specifically, on on a list of 500 individuals uh, whose names um, had been drawn uh, by Ayatollah Khomeini as early as 1979, and you know, hit squads were going around the world, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of one after the next. Um, um, so that that ought to be considered a huge accomplishment by an international community that has been trying over and over and over for the past 30 years to figure out a way of dealing with Iran. I, one would say that it was a pretty cheap way. Uh, you know, you know right. no, no bombs were dropped, no bullets were shot, and yet the regime started to behave. Um, but all of that, as you say, changed last year when we discovered that there was a plot against the life of the Saudi ambassador in Washington, and in fact, um, it was precisely sort of if had, it had been carried out, it would be uh, the same location, you know, I mean, a similar location in that it was going to be a restaurant in Washington, so on and so forth. Um, and then there have been uh, plots uh, in Indonesia and in India and, and all sorts of other places. Um, one can expect that as the pressure on the Iranian government increases through the sanctions and, um, and further on, uh, that these types of behaviors would increase, mm -hmm. that the regime will uh, react or elements within the regime will start to react uh, mm -hmm. in the ways that they knew uh, because all bits are off now uh, yeah. because the pressures are so much. 
Hey there, I'm a senior at UCLA and I'm here, with, I'm the president of the Persian community at Hillel. We're here with a group of 20. And my, what I wanted to say was it, it saddens me that the, the new Persian Jewish generation in America is almost ashamed to say that they're Persian Jews and when they talk to people that aren't Persian and Jewish, they, they don't like to identify. And what, what advice do you have for the, for the new Persian Jewish generation to, to be engaged and to spark passion into identifying with being a Persian Jew, and I, I emphasize Persian. And my first advice is to drop the term Persian. <laughs> uh, we're not cats, we're not rugs, uh, we're people. And the last time we looked at that country, it's called Iran. We're Iranian Jews. And, and that, whoever came up with that configuration of Persian Jews wanted certainly to avoid the current political dilemma in Iran, the things that we're most ashamed of, Khomeini and the 1979 revolution and the angry people throwing their fists at the cameras. So, th so we are, you know, if you, you can't create pride in Persian Jews because if they were proud, they wouldn't call themselves Persians to begin with. We're Iranian Jews. And the entire legacy of Iran up until last year is ours. And that includes Khomeini, and that includes you know, the takeover of the American embassy, the 52 hostages, we, it's, it's all ours. And, and we have to realize that you know, as long as we call ourselves Persian, we're trying to dissociate ourselves with all the bad stuff, and you know, we have to start meowing, uh, really. But, but we can't do that, so let's have a conversation about you know, about all of it. You know, all of it is our legacy. And all of it, in a way, is, is, a ba is, is, is something that we have to be accountable for or we have to be able to uh, claim as, as who we are, as, as the forces that have shaped our identity. Um, uh, and, you know, it, 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 but I think those of us who are Jews and are in this room, um, again, can probably be in a, are probably in a better position to defend that because we are the ones um, who are least likely uh, to have other relatives remaining in Iran. You know, oftentimes uh, Iranians who are afraid to say it like it is, to tell the truth, must worry about uh, community members, extended relative, mem members of the extended family who are still back there and they have to defend. Uh, or worry about, and, and they can't really speak in a, you know, tell the truth or, or speak in an open fashion. Um, we are often not in that position. Uh, we can tell the truth, and I think um, we are in a very, very important historic position to, um, to, to bear witness, um, to remember things really as they were, not as, you know, certain prejudices um, tell us to remember as. You know, it's very hard to uh, not allow other people to write our memories for us, to, to, to become the writers of our own witnesses and memories. And it, now, as I remember it, yes, my father talks about terrible things growing up in Iran when he was five, six, seven years old. My father, uh, grew up in a very small village, and he once was kept at home um, because it was raining nonstop for a whole week, and, he, and Jews were not allowed to go to public schools on rainy days because they were considered najis, they were considered dirty. Um, so that's a terrible thing that I grew up with, but as he told me this, he told me something else that I think is equally important that one day when my grandmother got fed up with the rain that wouldn't stop, he, he took my father's hand, he marched, she marched him to school and said to the principal that the rain hadn't stopped and she needed my father to be in school. And the superintendent who was visiting his school from Tehran heard the story and was very angry. So the superintendent marched my father to the classroom, told my father to fetch a glass of water, 
and he did. And when my father fetched a glass of water, the superintendent told my father to drink a sip from that glass of water, and he drank a sip. <coughs> and then he said to my father, now give me the glass. So that was the dirty water that the Jew had drank from, right? So my father handed the glass of water that he had drank from, gave it to the superintendent, and the superintendent drank the rest of the water, banged the glass on the desk in front of all the students, and said to them, if that water was good enough for me, it's good enough for all of you. And from that point forward, my father went to school. So was there discrimination in Iran? Yes, it was. But could it be challenged? And were there people who challenged it from, from within the Iranian community, non-Jewish community? Yes, they were. And that's what we as Iranian Jews can do. We can remember it as it was, as balanced, fair, just reporters who would not be swayed by all the pressures that are being exerted on us to say it in a, in a different narrative according to wishes of other groups to serve their purposes. Way to go, you Nora. said we shouldn't um, call ourselves Persian Jews. Yes, ma'am. But as I remember, Iran was called Persia for thousands of years. And only the last 100 years or less than 100 years is called Iran. So it's not un unappropriate to say we are Persian Jews. But it's not called uh, Persia anymore. But still, we feel ourselves Persian. You can say you speak Persian. You know, your langu the language you speak is Persian. That would be the right term to apply to the language. But as a nationality, you can call yourselves Persian, as so many of you here in this room do. But what, that hap what happens as a result of that is that you dissociate yourself from the, from the latter 100 years. And you know, then, then the president of the Hillel here will say, you know, why can't the students take pride in, in who they are? Well, because you know, it, it, the decision has already been made that our Persian-ness will stop at 100 years ago. We have to own it all, you know, up until, you know, we have to own Cyrus and Xerxes and the beautiful Persepolis, along with Khomeini and the hostage crisis and the embassy and the takeover. All of it is ours. Hi. Um, so we know there exists this, uh, this huge, profound fear uh, in Israel of a nuclear Iran. Um, and this one is definitely yours. <laughs> <laughs> no. This is, yeah, this is directed at, at I'd just like to say she, that, that Roya played a trick on me. She said, don't ask about a nuclear Iran because someone will ask. <laughs> then you ask, and she says, this one is yours. <laughs> They're very clever, these Iranians. Uh, yeah. You know, They're very, very clever. You've got to keep, you've got to keep pressing. <laughs> no, please, go ahead. I'm um, sorry. So I'm just wondering, among the Iranian or, or Persian Jewish community, uh, does this same fear reverberate? And if so, where is their alliance then lie? I mean, is it with Jerusalem or, you know, or is it with Iran? And, and I mean, that, that must bring up a, a host of <coughs> inner conflict. And as, as a Persian uh, Jew yourself, do you at all feel I'm an that, Iranian Jew. Oh, mm. I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> even I'm getting confused in all this. Um, do you feel that overblown or that there's that there's uh, you know kind of warmongering propaganda surrounding it that the Jewish community could be susceptible to I'm happy to start uh, if you want me to first of all I just want to just want to be careful not to suggest an equivalence you said is your loyalty with Tehran or Jerusalem Jerusalem is not threatening to wipe out Tehran Tehran is in fact threatening to wipe out Jerusalem so you might as easily ask, is your sympathy with the one that is being threatened or with the threatener? I think your sympathy ought to be with the one that's being threatened. Um, and all I would say is, is, is it likely that Iran will get a nuclear bomb and destroy not just Jerusalem, but uh, I mean, Israel is, as the Iranians like to remind us, a one bomb country um, to destroy, I mean, a place that's smaller than New Jersey. Um, and look what the storm did to that. So the answer is, no, it's probably not likely, but it is certainly well within the realm of possibility that when you have a president who says explicitly, 
that we want to destroy Israel, we want to wipe it off the map, and is actively pursuing getting a nuclear bomb, that you'd have to be, I mean, if it were your neighborhood, if Khomeini took over Texas, I wonder what the adjoining states would do. <laughs> would they say, well, look, you know, it's just rhetoric, shouldn't worry about it. This is, uh, I, I mean, the phrase is overused, this is an existential fear. This is people who have the kind of hatred that you just heard in the drinking glass incident, because remember that it took one courageous man to do that, which meant that the prejudice was general, who are seeking a nuclear bomb, who doubly not only have a prejudice against Jews, but detest the idea that there's a Jewish state in the midst of their, their sort of seamless set of Muslim states. Should you be afraid? Yeah. I mean, if you're in Israel, you should be very afraid, especially when it is within the human memory of many people who are still alive that there was somebody who tried, in fact, to wipe out all the Jewish people. So you put all those together, and it's hard to say, oh, they're just being paranoid. You might say it might not happen, but if you were the one who was responsible for the safety of the people who were being threatened, I think you wouldn't sleep very well at night. And, and I'm sure that whoever the Prime Minister of Israel is doesn't. Your turn. That was very good. <laughs> Thank uh, you. So, um, I, uh, I think that I feel about this question that I often get asked uh, in the same way that I feel about the term Persian Jew. I think it's the wrong question to ask. And um, I, I get this, got that question so many times uh, over Facebook and, and email that it prompted me to write it as an, a response as an op-ed which ran in the New York Times, which you right. saw. Um, I think it's a wrong question to ask, especially at a time when our global community uh, is increasingly more um, uh, multi-charactered. In other words, we are uh, no longer one thing or the other. You know, we, we are uh, Iranian Jew, Iranian American Jews. You know, uh, we, we have different strains of nationalities and ethnicities uh, running through us. We are no longer, you know, pure human beings if a pure human being ever existed. Um, so I think our loyalties and our uh, affections are equally distributed among the various dimensions or threads that run through our identities. Um, so I think it's the wrong question to ask. I, I wouldn't want uh, you know, Israel or Iran to be bombed either way, and I think uh, a war would be a wrong uh, response to what's going on. In the meantime, of course, there are realities uh, for a small country like Israel uh, to face, and I think uh, to some degree, we have to actually look at this whole thing and say, so far, so good. I mean, um, this, this whole anxiety over the, a war between Iran and Israel has been ongoing for several, several years now. And by various means, uh, you know, electronic viruses, you know, Stuxnet and uh, this, that, or the other thing, uh, uh, an imminent war has been averted, not just for a week or two or a month, but several years. So I think um, while we worry about a potential war, we also, we also should acknowledge the fact that an imminent war has not taken place for nearly five or six years. And that's an accomplishment, that whatever is happening uh, through these other 21st century modes of aversion has been working. And therefore, we have, um, we have not engaged in a war. And, I, and I'm hoping that you know, if we take care of several other regional problems, for instance, Syria, right. which is a key uh, pillar for that, that keeps the Iranian regime propped up, um, and if we take care of the various violations and crimes that occur, have occurred over the past several years in Lebanon in a way that delivers justice uh, truly to the victims and, 
and apprehends the perpetrators, that 50% uh, of the Iranian problem will immediately be solved. For last question, I want to leave here not necessarily happy but satisfied. <laughs> Getting back to this question, talking about Persian or Iranian, um, we look at ourselves as dissidents. We look at ourselves as some people, people who have nothing to do with the Iran that says uh, down with America and down with Israel. That's why we call ourselves Persians. When I deal with my clients, when I say I'm, they say you're Iranian and I say I'm Persian, uh, immediately they change. They treat me like, like someone who came from so, Shah's time. So then that's, that's the question, I think. I, I'll, I'll answer this for Roya since she's answered it, and then she'll tell me if I'm right. <laughs> you, you don't want the Iran that you grew up in or that you left. And when you mention that Iran to other people, they react badly. And what Roya, I think, is saying is, until you actually take on the parts of your identity, even the negative parts that are a part of you, because after all, you lived there when these things were happening, or you fled these things, and therefore they're a part of you whether you like it or not, until you in some way own those, you can't be complete. As long as you say, all the things that happened lately, they have nothing to do with me, when in fact they're the history of the country that you grew up in, then you're splitting off pieces of yourself, and that makes it hard to be whole, even though it's understandable that you do it because people react badly to it. Now I know why you're number one rabbi. <laughs> And on that note. Uh, no, but, but I, uh, I'd like to say uh, yeah, one more thing, please. which is that in a way, since you're a therapist and you, you conjured that, that parallel, I have to say that you know, uh, people get divorces all the time, but the, the thing that they teach you is not to, you know, is to allow the child of a divorced parents to, to claim both parents, even the one that the mother hates or vice versa. You, you can't dissociate yourself from dimensions of your identity that, that you happen not to like. And if you want to kind of remain a whole human being, you have to own it all. And you have to be able to, to talk about it. You have to be able to justify or voice your opposition to every dimension of it. And I think that, that is really the way that, that we can remain, uh, we can deal with the problem head on. So we thank want to you. thank our guest, Roya Hatakian.